I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science. I'm Taylor Sparks, your co-host, and I'm joined, as always, by my trusty co-host. How are you, Andrew? Good. Finally graduated. Ready to start (laughs) uh, chapter two of my life. We are not just joined by regular Andrew, but master of science Andrew. Congratulations, Andrew. Proud of you. Thank you. Um, And we are today super duper excited. We are bringing you live uh, to experts from General Electric as part of a fantastic new series that we have together. It's a series of episodes we're going to have on General Electric, so stay tuned. There's going to be about half a dozen of these things, and they run a a wide variety of super cool topics related to material science. Now, if you haven't listened to our prior episode, that's episode 20 on materials informatics, it might be a good idea to check that one out first, because this is going to build on that and get some of the jargon and vocabulary out of the way. But you'll probably find to listen to this one regardless if you don't want to. This must be one of our all-time most requested follow-up episodes. People loved the materials informatics episode. And maybe that's because like Andrew and I work in that area and some of the enthusiasm bled through. I'd like to think that's part of the reason. Whatever the reason, people have wanted more of that. And today we are going to talk about materials informatics with General Electric as a case study and with their perspective from industry. And to do that, we've got two folks with us. We're joined by Andy Detour and Kareem Agour. Andy, Kareem, want to do an introduction? Yeah, sure. Taylor, Andrew, it's a pleasure to be here. I really enjoy your podcast and uh, just like to, to talk with you about what we're doing at GE and materials informatics. So yeah, my name is Andy Detour. I'm a senior principal scientist at GE Research, been with the company about 14 years, backgrounds at high temperature metals, and uh, recently been getting into machine learning and, and understanding how it can help us uh, develop new, exciting materials faster. So really looking forward to talking about it. Fantastic. How about you, Kareem? Okay, yeah, th- thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here as well. Again, my name is Kareem Agor. I'm a principal scientist at GE's Research Center in upstate New York, and I uh, informally lead a team that does a lot of research at the intersection of knowledge management and data management. So what we're trying to do is capture a lot of the knowledge that's typically captured, uh, that, that's really locked away in experts' uh, heads, and trying to put that into a computable form so that computers can uh, reason over that kind of knowledge and make decisions that, uh, in very similar ways that humans do. So Kareem, this is fascinating that we here we are on a material science podcast talking to a knowledge systems expert. Like, what is your background? What led you to get involved at General Electric? So my background is actually much more around uh, scalable, uh, compu- uh, scalable data management. So I do a lot of work around, uh, you know, digital thread and data management, particularly around, you know, big data management. But really over the last uh, four or five years, I've been really working uh, with folks like, uh, you know, Andy Detour and uh, in particular, I really kind of first got engaged around uh, additive uh, data management. So I was really approached by folks like Andy uh, from material scientists who said, hey, you know, uh, within the additive space, we're, we're generating a lot of uh, uh, data and really a lot of variety of types of data, you know, a lot of relational data, a lot of images, a lot of time series sensor data. And we're really struggling to be able to put all this data together analyze it, you know, trying to, to, to really try to understand, you know, do a lot of root cause analysis, understand, you know, the sources of defects. Um, and so they came to me and said, you know, what are some ways and approaches that we can start to bring this data together, link it together and analyze that data? So at the time we were really uh, using a lot of different um, knowledge driven approaches, using semantics and ontologies to model different types of data to link that data together. And so I propose that we use these kind of technologies, these kind of approaches to, to, to link that data and analyze it. That is so And rad. so kind of one thing led to another. And so I kind of, you know, got hooked up with Andy to, to look at materials informatics as, as kind of an approach um, to use ontologies and use semantics to model data, link, to, to link it and analyze data. And that kind of led us to, to looking at and exploring approaches to, to kind of looking at second wave and third wave approaches to kind of analyzing material science data to, um, to look at ways that we can start to address the challenge of how do we actually kind of accelerate the, the development and discovery of new materials. Rad. Yeah, well, and I think it's a good application too because data and material science is so varied, right? A lot of it is quantitative, but then there's a lot of qualitative aspects to it too. It's not usually as easy as just putting it into some sort of tabular form and running a simple model on it, right? It has many different dimensions that are not always easy to interpret. 
Well, before we get into uh, what I'm sure is going to be exciting to hear about how that process has worked, uh, for the few people that have been living under a rock for the last, you know, couple hundred years, Andy, can you tell us, you know, General Electric, what's your mission? What do you guys do? What's GE Research about? Yeah, sure. Well, you know, when I say General Electric, a lot of people think light bulbs and refrigerators, <laughs> and uh, we actually don't do that anymore. So GE today is a, is a high-tech company focused in three main businesses. So aviation, we make aircraft engines. Uh, roughly two out of every three commercial flights is powered by a, a GE engine, uh, which I think is an That's incredible awesome. stat. Yeah. Uh, we have a whole power gen business. So wind turbines, gas turbines, uh, one third of the world's electricity is generated through GE devices. Uh, and then we have a healthcare business that most, most folks uh, don't really know as much about that does a lot of imaging. So MRI machines, ultrasound. I think it's something like 16,000 scans per day uh, done on GE machines. So these are the three core businesses. And the research center, we work with all of them. And about half of our business is directly engaged with, uh, with those folks trying to help get new products to market, trying to solve problems with existing uh, equipment. And then the other half is uh, with the U.S. government. We do a lot of uh, really far out there uh, government-funded projects with DOD, DOE, NIH. So it's a really interesting place to work because we get that, you know, the real near-term applied business uh, research and development, but we also get to work with academia and, and uh, government-funded programs. So it's a really dynamic place. That is awesome. So uh, what prompted you guys to make this big leap and start thinking about informatics? Because it's not trivial, right? I, I think of like just the old schoolers that I've interacted with in material science who are like, you know, this data science is a load of nonsense sort of thing. Like, was it a hard sell to get GE on board with this concept? It, it wasn't a hard sell. And I'd say at this point, we're really doing it out of necessity. Um, and, and it's it, we've kept our eye on machine learning, materials, informatics, and the great stuff that academics are doing. And I'd say about five, six years ago, uh, there was two real projects that required uh, really materials informatics to just wrap our heads around the complexity. So Kareem mentioned it early on, additive manufacturing. You know, GE uh, makes and sells additive machines. We make uh, lots of parts in our engines with additive. And it's such a complicated process. There's so yeah. many variables that go into it. Uh, and, and so we wanted to try to understand that. And, and one of the best ways to do it is with these modern tools that can capture all that complexity and allow you to see trends that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. So maybe we can hop into some of those um, case studies that you have, specifically on additive manufacturing and how GE approached that problem and what were some of the considerations and how machine learning helped you address those. Yeah, yeah sure. So yeah, Kareem, you know, jump in if you want on this because you were heavily involved uh, from the beginning. Um, but as a material scientist, we're interested, you know, in process structure properties, right? That's the, the core paradigm. And so uh, the program that we had specific to additive, and we're still doing this work, is what are all of my uh, processing variables? What are all the knobs I can turn on my machine? Uh, coupled with what are all the different material compositions, the different alloy compositions I can put in my powder bed? And how can I, for any arbitrary composition, define uh, an ideal processing window where I have a, a you know, robustness, where I'm not going to be generating any defects, and I can build a material that has the properties that I need. Um, and so part of the work Kareem did was to really help build a platform to ingest all this complexity of data and a framework where the average material scientist, someone like me, could go in and use a platform to, to look for those trends and to try to identify uh, what direction to go in for the next set of experiments and really try to get to an answer uh, faster than we, we could have otherwise. So Kareem, I think this is interesting because in materials informatics, we typically sort of two, see two approaches. There's like some folks who are like, we've got so much data. All we need is algorithms that can capture these subtle threads of like patterns in the data. But the data is there. Like the, the, the trends are there. All we need is a tool to capture those trends and to then exploit them. But then the other school of thought is really like we actually don't have that much data. Instead, what we have is this massive space with many processing or many compositional tunable parameters. And what we need is an approach that can iteratively tell us what's our next step to most effectively explore this space. So minimizing your uncertainty or something like that. So 
uh, this is sort of like the Bayesian versus frequentist approach. And I was curious if GE has approached this with one approach or the other, or if you're trying to do both, or if you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, it was very much the, the, the latter kind of problem. And so we actually uh, ended up going with the Bayesian hybrid modeling approach because the, you know, the, the search space was so, so vast and, you know, the, the ability to, to explore it was so challenging because, you know, the l limited number of, you know, additive builds that we could actually run compared to the, the size of the search space. So what we ended up, as I, as I said, was, you know, going with kind of a Bayesian hybrid modeling approach where we, we developed a BHM model that would, um, you know, analyze the, the data iteratively and, and give us recommendations on the next best uh, experiments to actually run within the search space and then iteratively tell us, um, based on the amount of experiments that we have or the amount of data that we have, what the next set of experiments we should be running um, so that it could, you know, iteratively narrow uh, the, the search space down to, to, to identify what the overall best um, search space or, or volume um, would actually be. And so as Andy was, was saying, what it, what it ended up doing was telling us what the overall um, envelope would be for the, for the optimal um, um, build space. So that instead of just giving us, you know, a single point solution saying, you know, this is the best, you know, um, process parameter combination, it would actually give us, you know, a, a window saying within this overall yeah. um, process parameter space, you know, this is, this is kind of the, the, the envelope so that if there is, you know, slight variations in the build, we're still, you know, um, giving us the minimal amount of defects for the, for the parts that are actually being produced. So I think this is, I think most of the field of material sciences kind of approach that the same way. Because we just don't have, first off, huge data sets. And even if we did, I think it's kind of dangerous to assume that, like, all of your learning is there. You just have to extract it. And then you're going to be able to make these, like, perfect predictions of this amazing new material. Because when it doesn't work, everyone's like, well, what's wrong with it? Right? But, this, yeah. but the approach that you described is totally different. It's like, hey, we're just going to get better and better. We know that there's a lot of unknowns, but this is a way to systematically explore. In other words, you were going to do a bunch of experiments anyways. Let us help you pick the best next experiment. Uh using a statistics approach. Yeah, and I think the systematic aspect of it is really the the key there because a lot of times if you're in a really high dimensional design space, it can feel like you're just playing a game of darts. <laughs> where you're just kind of randomly throwing it and maybe you get a hit, maybe you don't. But having that systematic progression through that high dimensional space that's difficult for humans to visually comprehend is is key to to actually leveraging the power of that data. Yeah, and I think it's so important to make sure that the the final recommendation it can't be, you know, that you're trying to balance on a nice edge and saying that that the resulting, you know, process parameters can't be that this exact perfect, you know, value. Otherwise, you know, you're going to end up with a part that's that's terrible. You've got to make sure that there's some, you know, flexibility in, in yeah. the results because you're not going to get the exact laser power, the exact laser speed that you want. You know, there's got to be some, you know, tolerance for, for slight variation around that. So talk about high dimensional search space. Let's talk high entropy alloys. Oh, geez. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've seen the math on these. So I'm not going to go through any of that math, right? That's like the first <laughs> slide in everyone's presentation at these high entropy alloy conferences. But suffice to say, it's well, for those who don't know, high entropy alloys are very unique. They're unlike most conventional alloys that are built on a base alloy, uh, a base element, excuse me, like steels are, are based on iron. Most of what's in steel is iron. High entropy alloys sort of throw that out the window and say, uh, I'm just going to take elements from all over the periodic table and throw them in a pot, mix it up and see what happens. And so you can have, you know, four or five, six elements all in significant quantities, you know, 20, 30%. Yeah. And it's just an unexplored space. And it's so, surprising too, because they tend to make simple structures, right? Unexpected to me anyways. That was very surprising. Yeah, they tend to make simple structures and they tend to exhibit other properties that are they're very unique. So that's why so that's why GE is interested in high entropy alloys. We have a actually a couple projects now that are are really uh, deep into these systems. I assume it's for we, refractory, like you want the high temperature stability. That's right. That's right. Mostly in refractory high entropy alloys. Okay. And yeah. uh, and the promise there, you know, the conventional refractory alloys, the Achilles heel has always been oxidation resistance. Right. You know, which is which is kind of funny because they're they're so good mechanically at high temperatures, but they form such volatile oxides that you you, know, you have to apply coating. So the question is, can you get a better balance of properties using a high entropy alloying approach in the refractory space? And from an MI perspective, how do you do that in such a massive compositional space? Right, right. And this is where, like, you know, it was necessity for us to adopt and learn, really learn on the fly. Uh, how to do materials informatics, how to do machine learning, data strategy, high throughput experiments. 
And so, you know, we had a, a project, uh, it was two years ago, and uh, we were looking at uh, refractory high entropy alloys. And what we did was we set up uh, a high throughput experiment uh, where we could run about a dozen alloys per week, which may not sound like high throughput to some people, but dude, that's great. For stru- high temperature structural metals, that's pretty pretty quick. And we were trying to do a multi-objective optimization uh, process here because we needed oxidation resistance, we needed ductility, uh, we needed strength at high temperature. And so we set up these experiments to quickly assess those key properties. And we fed all of this into a machine learning model, which we ran in an active mode or sequential learning, some folks call it. And uh, it was a cool project because we, at the time, we didn't yet you know, quite fully trust machine learning. So we ran our experimental campaigns one of two ways. One way was we said, we're just going to let the computer tell us what to do. Let's do Bayesian optimization give us a list of alloys to run next and we'll go do it. The other half of it was let's use good old metallurgist intuition. Let's just try to understand it in our brains and think about it. And, um, and, and we kind of went back and forth over a 15 month period. We ended up screening 367 unique alloys and discovered a space that's very unique, a Pareto front that's very unique uh, using these machine learning methods that I don't think we would have found if we did it you know, quote unquote, the old fashioned way. So it really opened our eyes at GE to the power of these methods. Dude, that last part is really what gets me like, how do you prove that it was better than what was out there, right? So like sometimes people do like random search, they'll take some of their experiments, like, you know, had we done this with random search is where we would be at. But it's easy to like, be like, okay, well, you found some stuff. Be like, no, that was hard. Like how we would have never known to look for these things. One question I've got for you, Andy, is how did you pull off the multi-objective optimization? Because I've seen several different ways where people try and do this. I'm curious what you guys did. Yeah. So this one, this one, we were worked closely with our designers. So we were trying to design a a system here. And so there, there were requirements or sort of minimum viable property values that we had to hit across all of our metrics. So once we had those sort of minimum viable, you need to have at least, you know, this uh, uh, melting yep. temperature, you need to have at least this strength. Uh, once we understood those, then we just wrote out, in this case, we just wrote out a multi-objective function. Okay. So okay. each term had a, was one property scaled by the min viable value. So your, then loss, we just, your loss function was a single value, which was it. a composite of several things you cared about. Okay. That's right. Yep. And then the system was just seeking to maximize that. Uh, objective function. I think that's the most common way I've seen it done, but there's some cool emerging ways that uh, get around that instead of a single loss function, treat it in a true high dimensional space. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, well, a lot of the issues with building like a utility function like that is that you kind of set the relative importance of these different uh, metrics prior to actually running that. Um, Just because a lot of these things exist on very different uh, scales you know, one might be a qualitative assessment where you're saying, was this coding good or bad? And the other might actually be just be the hardness. And so trying to put those into a single utility can be an interesting challenge. Um, I think multi-objective optimization is really an interesting problem because the way that you tackle it can have a huge impact on the results that you get oh, totally. and the, the approach and, the, and how far into the Pareto front that you get. So I think that was, I, I think the utility function is a, a great like approach to it. Simply because, like, by combining all these things into one, I don't know, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say that it is clearly an open research area because when I go to conferences, I hear all sorts of people talking about, like, what is the right way to deal with multi-objective? It's an, it's an open question, I think, in this evolving field. And, and, it, and it's enabled by materials informatics. Materials informatics is allowing us to do multi-objective optimization in a quantitative way because now we have these surrogate models that are fast acting that we can run in, in any of these optimization frameworks. The other direction I think we're, we'll be going in the next decade is, is trying to couple these surrogate material models into multidisciplinary design optimization framework. Oh, yeah. So MDO is very mature, right? Yeah. They're, they're integrating structural, aero, thermal models. They don't yet really integrate materials in a quantitative way. So I think that's gonna be a big part of the future enabled again by materials informatics. Well, pivoting back to this sort of like direction then for GE, I, I don't remember where we first met Andy, but I do know that one of the early times that we interacted was when I learned about ML4M, machine learning for materials. And this is a general electric initiative 
which began what last year, I think in 2021. Um, that's right. And I know that you've brought in some speakers. I know that's how I got involved with it. I had a chance to sort of say, here's what's happening in academia in my little corner of academia. But can you tell us more about ML for M and what you're hoping to achieve with that? What are the goals? What's the process that you're following there? Sure. I remember when we met, I think it was at uh, MRS Boston conference. Okay. And I remember going to your talk and I was like, that's the guy who has the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. Um, so yeah, we, we started this initiative we call Machine Learning for Materials or ML4M, the beginning of 2021. And, and really it was a, a, a conscious push uh, that our leadership uh, kind of drove to, to build or you know, foster materials informatics at GE Research and across the General Electric Company in general. And so, so I and a team of some other folks who are really passionate in this area have been working it over the last year and a half. And uh, we really break it down into largely three categories. So one's focused on our data strategy, kind of getting our house in order yeah. around data. Um, another group of folks are looking at machine learning case studies, which is let's just try some quick and dirty projects and show people how effective and how powerful yep. these models can be. And then we also are looking into high throughput methods because I think it's uh, it's like peanut butter and jelly, right? Uh, machine learning and high throughput experiments go hand in hand. And uh, so we're trying to think about ways we can generate data sets quicker using high throughput. Rad. So, okay, Let, let's step through s some of the cases then. So you've got this data strategy. We've talked about case studies high throughput materials, third wave AI, where are you in that? Are you trying to do all these things all at once? Are you sort of systematically approaching it? What, what's the strategy here? Yeah, we're doing them all at once. Um, and I mean, I could go into detail in each one and, and bore, bore you all with that. Um, but we're trying to do everything at once. We've got a team of, I don't you know, there's probably 20 people who are spending, you know, a fair amount of time on this, really trying to push it forward. Um, we are also uh, hiring in this area. So we, we actually stood up a materials informatics lab this year and where we're, you know, looking for uh, the best and the brightest uh, come check out GE research. Cause we're looking for people that have a material science background. Everyone's uh, invited but, except for Andrew. You, <laughs> you have to stay here and help me with the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's awesome. Yeah. So w was there something specifically you wanted to, well, I mean, into there? maybe we'll kick it over to Kareem. Like, tell me like, if this was at general or not, if this was at say Netflix or something, the data strategy would look one way. What are some unique aspects about managing data at a big materials company? I mean, really, I think that the big challenge is, you know, for, for a company like GE, I mean, we've just got this, you know, massive legacy, you know, of 150 plus years. I mean, the reality at the end of the day is that GE is, you know, a materials company. Uh, I'll just say, I heard this fascinating quote from Jim Warren. I'm curious to hear your opinion on it. He essentially argues that the amount of data that's being generated, like there's more scientists alive now than have ever existed in the past. Like that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a true statement. And it might arguably be true that the amount of data that we're generating for materials right now dwarfs anything that existed in the past. So his sort of idea was like, who cares about capturing the old stuff? Because it is hard. It's in like old lab notebooks. He's like, who cares about that? Do we just focus on capturing, getting a plan in place that captures the existing data going forward, or should we really try and look backwards? I know Andrew, Andrew's got thoughts on this, but I'm curious what you think, Kareem. No, I, I think, I think uh, we absolutely need to make sure that, that we have a rigorous process for capturing the data that, that we're generating today, but I absolutely think it's critical to capture all the historical legacy data as well, because there's a lot of insights, and I think there's a lot of value to, to all the experiments and all the, all the things that have been done in the past. I think there's, there's a lot of you know, value to, to that legacy, to that history. But I think it's more than just the the, the, the data, the, the bits and bytes of the, the, the data itself. I think there's also a lot of value to, to what's kind of locked away into the material scientists experts' minds as well. I view that as just as critical, if not more so than the, than the data itself. And I think that that's a really a rich and really important part to, 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 you know, the kind of the bottom, the third wave AI aspect as well. So from my perspective, it's not just the data, it's also the domain expert knowledge. That's really a key um, part of our strategy, part of our materials informatics uh, strategy as well. So how do you leverage that? Yeah. That... I think you really have to, to, to understand how you can get at that, how you can capture that from the domain expert knowledge and how you put that into a computable, computable form. That's really how you leverage it. It's, it's fantastic that, that, you know, 
Andy and you know uh, guys like yourselves have that domain expert knowledge and, and you can kind of use that to guide and shape the work that you do. Um, but I think you really have to actually extract that from the domain expert knowledge from the domain expert but, and put that knowledge into a computable form and get that into a computer so that it can reason and use that knowledge um, you know in much the same way that, that you guys actually do. So one one form of domain expert knowledge is equations, right? So in our heads, we like the Hall Patch equation, we all know, right? That yield strength will be proportional to one over square root of grain size. And so you could put that into a knowledge graph. If you had the grain size of material, but you didn't have a strength prediction, you could use Hall Patch, for example. But then the, beyond that, there's you know more qualitative reasoning that we have. Like you, you know, you you turn the temperature up and you know, the flow stress will go down, but we don't really have an equation for that per se, but we know that if that goes up, this goes down. So how do you incorporate that sort of knowledge? Yeah. Is this like interviews or taking like the write-ups and hitting it with NLP and then creating these, I, I guess you talked a little bit about this at the AIM conference this February or April. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little more about that? Cause I think that that is such an interesting area, but it's not quite clear to me how we capture that knowledge. It's not quite clear to us either, <laughs> but it's something that we're working on. So. I love that you're working on it. Yeah, no, we're working on because because we see this data scarcity problem, and it's it's a it's going to always be a problem in our field. You brought up, you know, Netflix or Facebook. So I, I ran some some cool numbers here that I think are pretty provocative. If you look at just how much data is generated on the internet um, every day, uh, it's about two and a half million terabytes. If you look at all of the data stores that are accessible in material science, plus you know the seventeen thousand design curves we have at GE. It's about 57,000 terabytes. And so every 30 minutes, there's more data generated on the internet than the collective whole of all that's accessible in material science. So like we're, we're, not, gonna, we're not gonna have the levels of Facebook and Netflix you know, data ever, but what do we have that they don't? We have physics. We have, you know, these materials are driven by mechanisms that we understand. We have domain expertise and experience. So that's the point is how do you include that on top of the data to, you know, push things forward? Rad. Well, Andrew, I'm kind of curious from a case studies perspective, jumping back to the case studies uh, mm -hmm. among the two you mentioned or others you want to bring up, uh, had there been like smoking gun, like amazing, just killer success stories? Uh, maybe not allowed to talk about them. They might be preliminary, but I'm curious, has it been like, holy cow, like we've hit the holy grail already? Or is it like, just tantalizing evidence that you're on the right track? Well, I can't say that we, the holy grail for us would be to, to develop a new material or a whole new process that's in production and, you know, being used out by the world, right? I, I can't say that we're there yet, um, but there's been so many tantalizing aha moments that have come about with materials informatics that it's, it's a snowball. I mean, it's just building now. Um, I think our businesses are starting to understand that where material development used to be like a 10 year, 10 plus million dollar prospect. And folks are very hesitant to, to invest in that, especially today where technology is moving so fast. Um, what we're seeing at GE and what I'm sure other industries are seeing as well is that materials informatics is going to sort of flips that on its head because now I think we can develop materials at a closer pace to, to product development. Okay. Well, how about this? We were at this conference recently in Denver and Andrew, could interrupt me if you want. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's really telling and important that GE is um, being so public with its materials informatics yeah. initiative because a lot of people in the industry are still kind of scared of it. And, you know, they're waiting for somebody else to take that leap. And I think seeing some of these big engineering companies finally jump in and show success or at least it's progress huge. towards using them is going to be huge in pushing other um you know, players in the industry to also adopt those methods. Totally agree. Awesome leadership and, role. And, and we owe it to, to folks like yourselves in academia, right? Because you, you showed us the way, really. I mean, <laughs> I, I've been reading papers about machine learning and material science for, for over a decade and, and, you know, starting from MGI, right, in 2011. And to be honest, when that first came out, I, I kind of wrote it off, right? Uh, this is just another hype cycle. But I, I don't think it is. I think that this is the way material science is going. That's awesome. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So Andy, you and I were at a, a automated, Kareem, were you there too? I don't remember. Uh, but we were at this automated uh, materials research and development conference, which was fascinating. It's not something I'd been to before, but imagine like 
if you took the humans out of the lab and it was just robots, right? That's kind of the idea, or that's like the end goal, right? Could you re- actually remove humans from the lab or, or had them do something else where their skills are more suited? Uh, this automated workflow clearly coincides with one of your goals of ML for M, which is high throughput materials. What's the status of sort of automated R&D at GE? Are you not even there yet? Are you beginning to explore it? I know I heard one of you guys talking about like, you're still arc melting things and how on earth do you automate like arc melting, right? Or, uh, or you know, you could say the same thing with many other processes. So I'm curious, what, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, th- we're just beginning, uh, to be honest with you. We don't, we don't have uh, robots running around our labs doing all our experiments for us yet. But, but again, I think this is, a, this is something that is coming along now because of this data scarcity problem. And it's, I think there's two ways to solve, to solve that. Right. One is what we've been talking about with third wave AI and how do we get smarter about what knowledge and information we can build into our models. But the other way is kind of like a, a brute force method. Right. Can we just automate our experiments yeah. to get them done quicker? And so I think that's a, a big part of the future. We've got some examples of where, you know, I, I mentioned 12 alloys a week, but that was a lot of it was manual labor. Um, but it's just getting smarter about how you batch things. Uh, smarter about how you run your experiments and this notion of it's, it's more about direction than perfection. Yep. 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 You know, something we hear about just to get me, guide me in the right direction quickly. I'm, um, I'm so, but it's, I'm, it's just starting. I'm kind of torn on this. Cause on one hand, I'm like, man, I have some grad students who just have like the touch. They can just make materials and they're so good at it. And so on one hand, I'm like, man, if I could just get the robot to be that grad student, they could just churn out great materials all the time. But on the other hand, I know that a lot of the awesome discoveries in material science were accidental, right? It was like that, oh, oops, I weighed the wrong amount in there. And then you go back and you figure out, well, what went wrong to give you this amazing property? Like, do, are we going to sacrifice that sort of serendipity if we move towards automated lab where, where they're just following the script from the ML algorithm? Like you've got a Bayesian tool that's saying, here's your next experiment. And we just follow that descent like down to wherever it leads us. Are we going to miss out on these sort of serendipitous discoveries, do you think? I think that's a risk and we need to be thoughtful of that. I think one, one, one way around it, I think is that the, you look at high throughput experiments, the, the cost now of doing an experiment is going to go way down. And so to go out and make mistakes is affordable. Okay. Right. And, and, and so what, one thing you could do to try and build that serendipity in is open your search space up beyond what you would, you know, do if you had to run old fashioned experiments that were really expensive. Um, so I think that's that's one way to try to find those surprises is just open up that search space enabled through uh, by high throughput methods. Yeah, I do a lot of work with uh, genetic algorithms, and one of the concepts within the genetic algorithm is this uh, mutation operator, where you randomly will introduce different mutations to your optimization data set that are stochastic in nature, and that allows you to break out of local minima or and prevent premature convergence. So it's almost like you need like the Bayesian to tell you like, here's your next experiment. And then you need to follow that with chaos. a genetic step, right? <laughs> chaos, yeah. <laughs> um, I actually kind of like that idea. Yeah. So wh- as you're starting to develop your own internal data sets, processes, procedures, one of the big questions that's still not really settled in the materials informatics community is what's the format of your data? And is it compatible with a lot of the other formats out there? Because Citrine has a data format. Uh, Materials Project does MPDF. Yeah, they all have different ones. How have you approached formatting your data in a way that's not only compatible with maybe people's expectations of how materials data should be formatted, but also allows you to leverage as much interesting um, other aspects, such as the ontological uh, facets of the data? This is a really hard question. <laughs> <laughs> On one extreme, in our, in our businesses, w- with their design data, like our aviation business has 17,000 plus design curves, right? That data is pretty well structured, and there's a format for it. And we have a, a product to, you know, that categorizes that data and makes it queryable and APIs and all that. But on the research side of things, our work's very messy, you know, we're all over the place, right? And so we, I don't know if there is one structure that's going to capture all that. I'm not sure if that's the direction we should be heading. One of the things we're experimenting with, and actually Taylor, this is building off of the data and brief oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. journal, yeah, yeah. is we're, we're calling it for the moment a data share article, which is uh, 
you know, we have internal reports that we can write a GE and, you know, proprietary, we could put them in our, in our, in our library. Uh, we're trying to spool something up now where folks can publish their data sets and uh, be so, able, you know, make them accessible to all GE employees with a, you know, two, maybe three page article that just describes that data, its provenance and wh- what it all means. I think that's a good next step forward for we've, us. We've talked a lot about like what should be the perfect end goal. And this is like on a big Slack channel with materials informatics people. And people are like, no, it should be this, it should be this. I think that we can't let perfect be the enemy of good in this case, right? Like yeah, yeah. You, maybe this data in brief or whatever this format you have is not like the end all be all, but it's a step in the right direction. And it's a it's initiating a culture change where this idea of my data is not my own. It doesn't belong in my lab notebook for me to look back on. This is company data. This is going to help many other people. And that means I have to make it in a format that helps other people, even if it's not perfect, like do, taking yeah. a step in the right direction. And where, where this really bites us is in our characterization lab. So we have a, a really, really nice characterization lab, all kinds of microscopes and TEMs and OJ, and we've got all this. So we generate a ton of images and data in that lab. And uh, it, you know, someone, someone at some point came up with 90%, 90% of that information just got, it's kind of squirreled, locked away into share drives and yep. folks' hard drives. And we got to make that accessible. It's too expensive, yeah, right? I'm a, yeah. I'm a big believer that communities really need to adopt, you know, standards, you know, for sharing data and that, you know, internally you can represent data however you want, but you need to, to map to some common data models and common data standards to be able to share data across, you know, organizations and across boundaries. So Kareem, I have a question for you now. Uh, as we're sort of approaching the end of the episode, I'm curious about this third wave AI idea, right? So we're not just building models that can find patterns in data. We're not just like building really good models that can deep learn or new ontology for that. Like we are after new contextual understanding, new mechanistic understanding, extracting insight more like to you, what is third wave AI and are we going to achieve it? What, what, what's missing for us to achieve it? So really, this concept of third wave AI really comes from DARPA. It's it's not you know a GE idea, but it really um, maybe we should take a step back and describe you know the first and second wave as as DARPA describes it. I uh, really, uh, I guess the, you know first wave is, as DARPA defines it really I guess became popular in the in the seventies. And the idea of first wave is these really kind of handcrafted rule based expert systems where domain experts would kind of create these very brittle you know if then else type rule based systems. So you can kind of think of like, you know, a TurboTax. And these systems, you know, work really well if the input data conformed exactly to, you know, what the system designers kind of expected, but they really, you know, fell apart if there's any variability, you know, in the inputs. And these, uh, you know, kind of second uh, second wave systems, which is really, I think, where we're kind of at today. You know, became really popular in the 90s and early 2000s. And they're, as DARPA describes them, were really kind of the statistical machine learning approaches. And the basic idea there, you know, and, and really the uh, second wave techniques are anywhere from, you know, simple, you know, linear regression all the way up to, you know, what, what's ubiquitous today, which is kind of like neural nets and deep learning systems. And really the idea is to really extract, you know, hidden patterns in data. And, um, you know, they're, they're really uh, very powerful and there's been a lot of, you know, really big successes in these second wave approaches. Um, but there's also um, been some, you know, major issues and, and, and limitations. And one of the big challenges with them is they're typically, you know, black box systems. And so we can't really understand kind of the patterns that are being extracted in them. And so they su- suffer a lot of limitations because um, they're really, uh, you know, constrained by the limitations of the data that, that are being used to train those systems. And so if there's any sort of, you know, skewed or gaps in the training data, they can also often lead to errors. And so what DARPA really means by, you know, third wave AI is they're really looking for the ability to have AI systems that can do what they call contextual reasoning and adaptation. And so instead of having these, you know, black box neural net systems that, you know, take a million images of cats and try and learn some sort of statistical representation of what what a cat is, they actually want an AI that can develop kind of a contextual model of what it means, you know, to be a cat. You know, what's the, you know, the body of a cat look like? What's the head, you know, shape of a cat, you know, pointy ears and whiskers and so on and so forth. And so when you see like a new video or a new image of a cat, it can say, oh, you know, I understand structurally what a cat looks like. And therefore, you know, this looks like a cat. So I can conclude it's a cat. And so if you know, you know, you know, if you tell an AI system, you know, it's never seen a tiger, never seen a lion. So, you know, say a tiger is a big cat with, with stripes, <laughs> Maybe can you know, it. you can, you know, show it, show it a video or, 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 or an image of a tiger. It says, oh, you know, it's kind of got the structural shape of a cat and it's got stripes. Therefore I can conclude, I can adapt and conclude that it, that it's a, a tiger. 
And so I think that's kind of the ba basic premise of what, you know, DARPA means by third wave, you know, so we can have contextual models to actually understand what these, you know, real world things are like a CAD and actually adapt to, to, to make conclusions and, 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 you know, kind of come up with, with new concepts. It, it certainly sounds like the more broad definition of like generalized AI, right? Can you build a model that does more than just what it was strictly trained on, but generalize it out, right? Uh, this is a big exactly. problem for all of machine learning research right now. And man, it'd be cool to see it happen with materials. So Andy, uh, this has been fascinating to hear about, like in theory, what this looks like. Do you have an example for me? Like, I, I would love to hear where you've actually tried this out. Yeah. So third wave AI, as Kareem explained it, it can, it can sound really daunting. And like how you can't, it's tough to wrap your head around it. So one of the things we tried to do, Kareem, myself, and a, and a, and a small team at GE Research, we tried to apply this to a real material science problem. So let's like, so we, we picked a problem that was like a classic materials development challenge, coatings yeah. on high pressure steam turbine blades. Okay. All right. This is like as real as it gets. These coatings are subject to harsh conditions, uh, erosion, steam oxidation. All right. So we want to develop a better coating for a steam turbine blade. So what we did is we, we, and it took about a year and a half. We sat down with the Kareem's team, knowledge representation experts. We had about three or four material scientists, including uh, the specialist who runs the coder that was doing the, the coatings. And we built an ontology that describes this whole project all the way from the variables that are used in the coding system to the microstructure and how we describe it that's developed all the way to the properties. In these case, we're doing steam oxidation and erosion. We put that ontology into a knowledge graph where we connected all the, all the pieces, right? So we know the connections between um, all of those, all of those attributes that we defined in the ontology. And then we said, all right, great. We got this thing in a knowledge graph. Now what can we do? So the first thing we did is we built in analytical knowledge. This is kind of the easiest one to do. Uh, we, we got about, a, uh, it was uh, 10 or 12 equations that worked in this ontology that, that we wrote. So, um, you know, the simplest one is like deposition rate. Sure. Yeah. If you don't know your deposition rate, but you know your thickness and your deposition time, well, you know, you can figure out your rate as an example of a very simple equation uh -huh. that we connected into this thing. Um, and then uh, Kareem and his team uh, built a natural language processing interface so that a material scientist could go in and say, uh, you know, could ask specific questions on data that was contained in the knowledge graph. So like for part ID number ABC123, what was the erosion rate, right? And it would come back and give you an answer. But then you could also ask questions where the answer was not in the knowledge graph but equations that could piece together parts of the knowledge graph to get you to an answer. And it could be two, three, four, five, or more equations deep. The system automatically can figure out that equation chaining and come up with an answer for you. So yeah. like there was an, you could ask a question about what was the ion flux for this uh, particular coding? And it would have to chain together, you know, multiple equations to get you that answer. Cause it's not in, you know, the data that we ingest into the knowledge graph. So it's, it's really been a cool process and we've learned a, a lot along the way. One of the things we learned is expert knowledge. It's there. We tried some things to encode it, but there's just a lot more work that needs to be done in that area specifically. That is so rad. Yeah. It's cool to see that from sort of beginning to end sort of adaptation taking place. I think that is so rad. Yeah. Normally you'd, just be like, oh, if I don't have this information, <laughs> I guess I'll have to go run some experiments or I guess I just don't have it and I'll have to do analysis without it. But even just yeah. having direction there, because I mean, you know, nothing's going to ever supplant raw data, but if you can get a very good guess or a good direction of what it might be, that's incredibly valuable. So yeah. And one of the reasons that, that this happened is because we have folks like Kareem and, and his team who are not material scientists, but they're experts in their field, their knowledge representation and reasoning, that field. And then you have the material science experts and, you know, I can walk down the hall yeah. and like, we can get in the conference room together. So that, it, that's just been really exciting for me. Kareem might have other you know thoughts, but for me, it's been really <laughs> exciting over the last mm -hmm. uh, year and a half to try to put this together and just, just learn. I mean, all, all of this has happened because it's been a fantastic partnership with, you know, Andy and, and the team. I mean, this has really been, and a wonderful experience for, for myself and my team as well. It's been, been really great. Well, as you've heard, GE is serious about 
Materials Informatics. I'm thrilled that they are because you're a leader in this space and other companies are going to hear this podcast, I hope, or hear about what you're doing and say, it's time for us to get serious about this too. So I appreciate the leadership role. And obviously what you're doing is a big effort and it's going to need people. So I assume you're hiring in the space. You mentioned that. Uh, we can put a link in our show notes, perhaps, uh, if people have, you know, if there's job openings that you want to fill now, or if there's an informational source where that people could learn more about this, we would be happy to point good people your way because you're doing awesome stuff. And it sounds like an awesome career if you're asking me. Yeah, we are absolutely hiring and not just in materials informatics, but uh, across multiple materials labs. So we'll put those links in. Okay. Anything else you want to tell us before we wrap? No, I think this has just this been a lot of fun, Taylor and Andrew. Thanks for hosting us. It's really been a pleasure to be here and, uh, and chat with you guys. Yeah, thanks so much for having us. It's been a pleasure. Okay, well, special thanks to our guests, Andy and Kareem. This was a blast to learn more. I think you guys are doing amazing stuff. I can't wait to hear about what you do next, especially this ontology stuff. Figure out how to get the knowledge from my brain, from Andrew's brain, from Andy's brain into our ML models in an effective way. And holy cow, we, we've, you know, that that's moving us towards the general AI that we need. So can't wait to hear more about what you're doing there. Okay, until next time. So uh, this is obviously just the first in a series of half a dozen or so. Uh, really cool episodes where we're going to be talking with GE. And this first one's on materials and informatics, but stay tuned. We have future episodes on super alloys, on barrier coatings, on what else? On CMCs, on all sorts of really cool topics. So you don't want to miss them. They'll be trickling out over this uh, course of this year. As always, special thanks to the sponsor of the show. Obviously, this episode is sponsored by General Electric, and we are very grateful to them for not only being forward-looking in terms of things like materials informatics, but also for reaching out to us, a podcast about materials as a unique way to get the word out about what I think is a really, really innovative company that I actually applied to when I was a postdoc, right? Very cool place. Behind every GE innovation is a breakthrough material. First, it was the tungsten filament that enabled GE to bring light bulbs to the mainstream in the early 1900s. Later, Lexan polycarbonate, invented by GE scientist Daniel Fox, ushered in generations of new plastics, from compact discs and DVDs to the helmet visors of astronauts who walked the moon. Through the latter decades of the 20th century to now, advances in nickel-based superalloys, titanium aluminide, the introduction of ceramic matrix composites, and the first 3D printed metal jet engine parts have helped propel commercial air travel beyond the Wright brothers' first 12 second flight at Kitty Hawk to some 100,000 flights happening around the world every day. Materials innovation has always been at the core of what GE does and central to the progress our products have driven. My name is Joe Vinsequera, and I'm proud to lead the Materials and Mechanical Systems Technology Organization at GE Research. Together, we are an interdisciplinary team of aerospace, mechanical, materials, chemical, and manufacturing engineers and scientists working to advance the state of the art for complex mechanical systems, innovative system level designs, advanced materials, and revolutionary manufacturing methods. Every day, our researchers explore the boundaries of cutting edge technologies that are poised to change the world. Whether shaping the future of flight, or aiding in the transition to a zero carbon energy future, our team helps GE stay at the forefront of innovation, enhancing our products and delivering for our customers. If you're ready to see, move, and create the future, consider joining our team at GE Research. To view our latest job openings, you can visit us at www.gecareers.com to learn more. That link is also available in today's show notes. And thank you for listening to today's episode. We are also brought to you by Elsevier in the journal Materials Today. You've heard us talk about this company before and this journal before. It is the flagship journal for Elsevier. It is a phenomenal publication outlet. I regularly find myself looking for subject matter experts, whether it's a killer review article or a really interesting perspective piece or an in-depth actual research article. And regularly, Materials Today is right there with as a great resource for that stuff. So if you haven't considered publishing there or checking their content out, I recommend it. But they're much more than the journal. Elsevier has conferences. They have a whole you know community they've created around material science. So props to them for that. Check out Materials Today. 
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Materialism Podcast. If you have questions or feedback, please send us emails at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you find your podcast. And if you like the show and want to help us reach more people, consider leaving a review. It helps us improve and it exposes new people to the show. Finally, you can check out our Instagram page at materialism.podcast and connect with us and let us know what new material you'd like to hear about next. We'd also like to give a shout out to Alphabot and Colobite for making the music for the podcast. They be- they both make a ton of really cool synthwave music, so go check them out on Spotify and YouTube. Catch you next time. See ya. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton, the makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials.